So I'm so excited to be here with you today. We're going to jump straight into the word, Acts 20, 17, Acts 20, 17. It reads like this. It says, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come down. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you. I love that the apostle Paul talks about, you know how I lived. I think he could have said that you've heard the messages that I've preached. You've heard the things that I've said to you. But Paul knew that the real impact isn't just the words we speak, but it's actually the life we live. It was uh, Francis Assisi that said, preach the gospel everywhere you can. And if you have to, use your words. I don't think that people choose not to believe in Jesus today because of a lack of information. We are in the age of information. I think it's a lack of passionate Jesus followers showing what it looks like to be the hands and feet of Jesus, being an example of what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. Paul said, you know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. I love that. I didn't shrink from saying anything to you. I don't know if you know this, but we live in a culture that is getting further and further away from this. And now it's getting to a point to where churches are getting canceled for preaching this. But I love that we're a part of the church that preaches the whole word because our authority is not culture, it's the kingdom of heaven. I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both the Jews and the Greeks of repentance towards God and the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction awaits me. This morning, I wanna talk to you from this topic. I am not okay. Uh, In February of 2020, My wife and I moved from Southern California to South Louisiana. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Southern California is very different than South Louisiana. Can I get an amen? Come on. I'm born and raised in South Louisiana, so I'm I'm normal. Um, In 2016, we took a job there on staff at a church. And at the beginning of 2018, my wife and I started a journey of trying to have children from really the beginning of 2018 all the way till we moved to 2020. And we didn't know it, but it was really just going to be a journey of miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. If you've experienced that, you know the toll that that takes on you, the toll that that takes on your spouse, and inevitably the toll that it takes on your marriage. In the middle of all this, we pack up everything and move back home, which it was great to be home with family, but in a lot of ways, it felt like we were restarting. It was a difficult season. And what I realize now that I didn't realize then is when we hit the ground running, we just went 100 miles an hour. I just jumped straight into ministry and she jumped straight into her job. And when we really should have taken a season just to pause and work on what was broken, we just buried it. Because who actually has time to deal with the broken things in life? I remember one afternoon in the middle of this season, I was eating lunch and a friend I'd not seen in years came up to me and said, hey, Joseph, wow, man, how, how are you doing? And you know when someone asks you how you're doing, you're not actually supposed to tell them how you're doing, right? <laughs> so I said, uh, I'm amazing. Everything's great. How's marriage? Marriage is phenomenal. I love being back home. This is the best. It's just everything is great. He left about five minutes later. I'm eating my lunch, and out of the corner of my eye, I see him coming back to my table. And he comes up and he says, hey, I I hate to be this guy, but I gotta be obedient to the Holy Spirit. How are you really doing? (laughs) Yeah. And the only way I can explain it, it's like one of those cartoons that's running 100 miles an hour and it stops and everything just catches up with them. I don't even know where these words came from, but I just said, I'm actually not okay. For the next 45 minutes, it was just, a conversation of me expressing the disappointment of trying to have kids for two years and moving everything back home and feel like we were starting and not having friends and being in a season of loneliness. It was, that conversation was the God conversation. You know, I'm convinced one day when we get to heaven, 
God's gonna show us our life and all the moments that we thought were coincidences were actually God incidences. Little angels visiting us along the way. But when I left that lunch, I remember going to my truck and for the first time I, I turned off my phone. I didn't turn on the radio. I just sat there for a moment and I had this revelation that I had gotten so busy doing ministry that it actually became impossible for me to receive ministry. I had gotten so busy dealing with everyone else's issues that it literally took someone hijacking my lunch for me to realize maybe I have some issues of my own. And if you can be honest this morning, I believe that there are some people here who find themselves in that same season of life. Come on, moms, I see you. You are wearing the mom hat and the wife hat and the work hat and doing everything that is mom that the thought of actually slowing down to deal with the broken things, it seems impossible. Dads are wearing the dad hat and the husband hat and the provider hat and doing everything that is dad that the thought of stopping for ourselves is laughable. We're always on the go. We're always in a hurry. I love what Jean-Marc Homer says about this pace of life that I'm talking to you about this morning. He says, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy because both sin and busyness have the same effect. They both cut off your connection to God, to other people, and to your own soul. So this morning, I have a question for you. How are you doing? Actually, how are you really doing? I believe in this story that we're reading, Paul models for us what we're called to do when we go through seasons of life, when we're honest enough to say, hey, I'm not okay. Now, the story that we're reading is in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is one of my favorite books in the Bible because it's the birth of the early church. Uh, in the beginning, you see King Jesus. This is now Jesus that's defeated death, hell, and the grave. That's why he's king. He's, he's King Jesus. And he's spending time with his disciples, teaching them about the helper, the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that Jesus ascends into heaven. The disciples come together in the upper room and then Acts 2, 4 happens. The Bible says that all the disciples were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So now we see the disciples filled with the Holy Spirit and they are spreading the gospel. For the first time, this news of Jesus transforming and changing your life is spreading and it's spreading like wildfire. Blind eyes are being opened. The deaf can hear, the lame are walking. Miracles are happening left and right. I mean, it's, it's the birth of the early church. And in the middle of this move of God, Acts 9 happens. Now, Acts 9 really changed the game because in Acts 9, a guy named Paul gives his life to the Lord. Now, it's important to know, Paul is considered after Jesus to be one of the most important figures in all of Christianity. Paul wrote 14 books of the Bible, four from a prison cell. Paul wrote Philippians 4.13 from a prison cell. Come on, you know that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Bible said that one time Paul was preaching and the Jews didn't like what he was saying. So they dragged him out of the city, killed him. They leave. The Bible says Paul pops back up, brother dusts himself off and keeps preaching. Yeah, Paul is a bad man. <laughs> Paul is a hero in the faith. Paul is like Superman. You read about his story. I mean, he seems unfazed and unbothered by anything. But in Acts 20, 19, we see another side of Paul that up until this moment we have not seen and it's what I wanna focus on this morning. Because in Acts 20, 19, Paul becomes vulnerable in a way that up to this point, he hasn't. Look at verse 19, he says, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews. Another translation says, I've done the Lord's work humbly with many tears. And I've endured the many painful trials that came to me from the hands of the Jews. For the first time, Paul says something that allows me to see the humanity side of Paul. In one sentence, Paul communicates that just because God has delivered him from seasons of persecution, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have wounds from those seasons of persecution. And with brothers in Christ, Paul begins to remove the bandage. 
Because what I've noticed in my own life is before something can be operated on, it's gotta be opened. So this morning, I wanna remove the bandage if I can and give you three things to do when you are not okay. The first thing that we see Paul do in this story is he had the right people. Come on, say the right people. Acts 20, 17, it says he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. The very first thing Paul did was reach out to godly people. I don't know if you know this, but after you get saved, the most important thing is who your influences are, who you're spending your time with. Now, I, I believe you don't attract what you want, you attract who you are. So if when I was broken, I attracted brokenness, I can't have the hope of the world living inside of me and still attract that. So after you give your life to Jesus, you should be attracting Jesus followers. Now, I wrote this template down. I'm calling it my two foundations of a friend. If someone is walking with you, if they are your covenant friendship, I believe they gotta have these two things. The first one is unshakable character. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Parents, let me talk to you for a moment. In the culture that we're living in, we can never be too protective over the influences of our kids. I'm telling you. Because what this verse is saying, mamas, I'm just, I'm just telling you. It's saying, I know your parenting's great, trust me, I know. I know they're coming to Sunday school, but don't be misled. Misled means to be fooled. One extended season with the wrong company corrupts good character. Corrupt means to destroy the original intent. It corrupts, it overrides good character. So this means that every relationship that we have in our lives is influencing and impacting our life. I used to buy into the lie that there was such thing as neutral friendships. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, uh, I, I was a Jesus follower, but I was still hanging out with old friends, buying into the lie that just because they drink and smoke didn't actually affect me. I'd have conversations with my pastor, like, pastor, look, they, they don't really affect me. Like, I'm, I'm just telling you, they, I, I know who I am that doesn't. I have conversations with married couples that say, pastor, I, like we're really the only married couple that's building our marriage on this and our friend group, but they're not really affecting us. No, no, no. There's no such thing as a neutral friendship, meaning every relationship in your life is either pushing you towards your relationship with God or pulling you further from your relationship with God. Don't ever buy into the lie that you can surround yourself with friends that are building their life on something other than God's word, his promises and truth, and it doesn't affect the way you build your life. There's no such thing as a neutral friendship. That's why I love Proverbs 13, 20. It says, walk with the wise, come on, say it with me, and become wise. If you came here looking for wisdom this morning, here it is. Just get around wise people. But look at the second part of this verse. What does it say? For a companion of fools suffers harm. Have you ever considered the reason your life is always a mess is because all of your friends are fools? Good morning. <laughs> I was having a conversation recently with a young adult after church and she was telling me why she's not okay. Big part of it was her best friend. And at the end of her 30 minute conversation about her best friend, she said this. She said, Pastor, you don't understand. My best friend is a liar. I was like, have you ever considered the issues? Maybe not that your best friend is a liar. Maybe the issue is that you've labeled a liar your best friend. Like we gotta do better at defining who are our relationships, who are our friendships. Now, I know what you're all thinking, so I'm just gonna say it. Pastor, aren't we like Christians? Isn't everybody supposed to be our best friend? No, no. Look at the Apostle Paul, Romans 13, eight. He says, we owe no man anything but to love one another. I want you to hear this. We owe people love, but we do not owe people access. Two different things. Uh, I will love you. I will pray for you, I will partner with you. As Jesus followers, we have the radical call to love people well. But if you are my friend, I'm giving you access. I'm giving you influence. I'm allowing you to speak into the direction of where I'm going, how I'm parenting my children, my marriage. We can love people well without giving them access. The first thing that you have to have is you gotta have friends that have unshakable character. The second thing every friend needs to have is unbridled honesty. Now that word unbridled just means unrestrained. Look at Proverbs 27, six. It says, the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. I love what Dr. Darius Daniel says. 
He says, an authentic friend would rather be willing to hurt my feelings than see me hurt my life. A real friend would rather speak the truth and hurt my feelings than stay silent and watch me hurt my life. I want to ask you a question this morning. When's the last time you had someone check you, challenge you, say something that felt like a wound? I might say that you don't have friends then, that you might just have followers. Listen to the language of this verse. It says the wounds of a friend. You ever had a wound? It's a never comfortable You need friends who will speak the truth. Now I want you to see this. This word truth points to reality. So a biblical friend brings me out of fantasy and into reality. Let me show you this. Fantasy. Pastor, if you think I'm gonna show up in a group with like six to other, eight other men and be in a life group and talk about Jesus, you're crazy. I'm not doing that. Fantasy. Reality. You are the company you keep. And if you are not intentional about surrounding yourself with faith-filled friends, You're gonna end up living a faithless life. You need people who will speak the truth. The first thing that Paul had is Paul had the right people. The second thing Paul had is Paul had the right posture. Come on, say the right posture. Look at Acts 20, 18 through 19. It says, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord. Did you know that there's only one posture in the kingdom and it's servanthood? Servanthood? I have conversations often with people that wanna know how to tell people about Jesus. And I always tell them, well, like the first step is you just serve them. Well, pastor, what about people that like have a different political opinion than me? Yeah, you serve them. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Pastor, what about people that like don't even like the church? Like they don't like our savior's church. They think we're weird. You serve them. Why? Because it's what Jesus did. Let me remind you, let me encourage you this morning. Our job as Jesus followers is to do one thing, sow seed. And every time we serve someone, we sow seed. God's job is outcome. And if we'll be obedient to do our part, he's got a pretty good track record at doing his. Now, transparent moment. Uh, I was recently having a conversation with my dad about three months ago and him and I have an interesting relationship because he's my boss and my pastor as well as my dad. So I never know when we're going to be watching a football game or when I'm going to be getting rebuked. It just it switches up quick. <laughs> Got to keep your head on a swivel. And about three months ago, we were having a conversation about ministry, talking about future and dreaming and planning. And about 45 minutes into the conversation, I realized that I had been talking for 40 minutes and he'd been talking for five. Now, if you don't know that, it's not a good ratio in a conversation. How many know people that just talk the paint off a wall, just suck the air out of a room? Come on. Okay, if you don't know those people, you are that person. <laughs> so, you know, 45 minutes into this conversation, and, and I just felt it. I just felt it. I'm like, wait a minute, this is not good. I uh, got in the car, and on the way home, I told my wife, I said, I said something. Hey, babe, babe, you're overthinking. No, I said something. I'm telling you, something's wrong. Three days later, I wake up to a text. Joseph, please come over to the house. Never a good text. (laughs) I go to the house and he says, uh, he says, I want to talk to you about something. I said, what's going on? I said, the conversation we had the other day, what you said bothered me. I said, well, what did I say? He said, everything you said bothered me. (laughs) Okay, all right. He said, I heard you say me, mine, and I more in 45 minutes than I have the last three years of your life. And he told me this, your posture's off. Because the first thing that changes when you're not okay is your posture. Come on, parents, your two-year-old lets you know by their posture that they're not okay. They throw themselves on the ground, they flip out, they'll hit you in the face with things. You know, just something's wrong. Some of y'all boudet in a corner. Y'all just come sulking, waiting for somebody at church to come and talk to you, okay? And some of y'all are like me, to where like when I'm not okay, I have to control everything. You have any control freaks here? And the funny thing is, when I'm not okay, it's usually self-inflicted. So I did something stupid, so now I'm running 100 miles an hour trying to fix everything that I've done. Let me pause for a moment. That's just about control. Control is an illusion. 
Like I can drive as carefully as I want, but I cannot control the person driving next to me. I can place the best bid on a home that I can, but I can't control it being accepted. Control belongs to one person, his name is God. And every time we try to control, we end up bearing God-sized weight. That's weight that we were never created to carry. That's why I love Psalms 55, 22. It says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Are you here this morning and you feel heavy? You feel like you're carrying something? You're not okay? Can I, make, can I encourage you to make this your bumper sticker scripture? Because this scripture is saying, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. If you feel heavy, it's always a sign that God's asking you to cast something that you're carrying. Let me ask you a question. How's your posture? If it's off, this morning, it's never too late to course correct. Because here's what I've learned as a parent. One of the things that brings me out of a bad, bad season when I'm not doing okay is actually serving others. Uh, before I had kids, I loved getting presents. Now, my favorite thing is watching my son get presents. You know what I'm saying? I'm the parent just like filming like this. Like, I love it. It brings joy to me. Why? Because what Winston Churchill says, he says, we make a living by what we get but we make a life by what we give. The second thing Paul had is he had the right posture. And the third thing he had is he had the right perspective. Acts 20, 22 through 23, as I close. It says, and now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction awaits me. Let me translate that. Every time life gets really, really hard, me and God get really, really close. Because the pattern of Paul's life was, God speaks to Paul, Paul speaks for God, Paul gets beaten and thrown into prison. He gets out of prison, God speaks to Paul, Paul speaks for God, and Paul gets beaten and thrown into prison. So what he's telling him is, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know why, but I'm constrained by the Spirit. In other words, I'm being used by the Spirit, not knowing what's gonna happen to me. But all I know is every time God uses me significantly, persecution awaits me. Wow, what a perspective to have. Running face first into a storm, knowing it's gonna hurt, but there's nothing greater than being used by God. I don't know how many of you know my story, but I'm a PK, which just means pastor's kid. So growing up, my entire life looked like this. I had midweek service, worship team rehearsal on Thursday, small groups on Friday, Saturday night service, and you start over on Sunday. I mean, you know the growing up in church experience. You get saved eight times, baptized nine times, and on the ninth time, they hold you down so long that you think you see Jesus. It's just part of it, I don't know what to say. And you know, I can honestly say that I never had a season in my life to where I was not okay. My parents married for over 35 years, phenomenal godly parents, an amazing set of siblings. It's blessed. And in September 11, 2015, everything changed for me. Start off just like any other day, and me and my younger brother Wesley, at the time I'm 24, he was 21. Went to go work at a furniture store and uh, we clocked off of work and I went to a restaurant and he went to a friend's house. I remember walking out of that restaurant and when I walked out, there was a big crowd by, by the street. I didn't know what was going on, but as I got closer, there was a guy that turned around and he said, uh, he, he's dead. I know he was talking about. As I got closer and the crowd split, I saw my 21 year old brother laying on the ground he was riding his motorcycle back from work and got hit and died on impact. And I will never forget being so disappointed with God. This is way beyond anger. This is way beyond hurt, deep disappointment. For the first time in my life, something had happened. that didn't fit into the God working all things together for the good. It just, I couldn't put the two and two. It just, it was too much for me. This triggered uh, the darkest season of my life. For the next year and a half, I turned to drug abuse. Uh, 
turned to alcohol abuse. I jumped from relationship to relationship. Looking back, now I know it was a depression, which by the way, depression is just suppressed disappointment. It's when you get so disappointed that you actually just accept, I guess this is just how it's always supposed to be. In this year and a half, I stopped going to church. I wanted nothing to do with God, nothing. For the first time in my life, I pushed everything away. About a year and a half into this, I get a text from a 760 number. It's a California number. And a text said, hey, I know you don't know me. My name's Obed Martinez, and uh, I'm coming to preach at your dad's church, and I think you need to be there. I don't know why, but I showed up. And I'll never forget hearing him preach a message called, you can still get there on broken pieces. For the first time in my life, I had this revelation that me walking in the plan that God had for me didn't require me to be good enough and then go to him. By the way, we could never be good enough to get to him. That's why he came to us. It doesn't require me to have it all together, get cleaned up, and then go. And it didn't even require me to understand why everything had happened. It just required one thing. Trust me. I remember that night I just broke. I was just a mess. I just broke. I was so sick and living in the state that I was living in. I ran to the altar. And he knelt down with me and he prayed with me. And that night, I really, for the first time in my life, actually surrendered my life to Jesus. Remember the next day, he took me to coffee and he said, hey, you need to to get out of here. This place isn't good for you. It's too much brokenness, too much familiarity. You need a fresh start. Two weeks later, I got on an airplane, moved to California. And I can honestly say I, I, I never looked back. And you know, I've told this story a handful of times over the past few years. And I feel like I finally have the right perspective. Because when I used to tell this story, I called it a disaster. But now I call it divine. Because had that had never happened, I would have never been broken. And had I never been broken, I would have never surrendered. Had I never surrendered, I would have never walked in the call of God in my life. And had I never walked in the call of God in my life, I would not be preaching to you this morning. So now, with heaven's perspective, I can look back in an event that was so painful for so many and see that it's been so purposeful for me. I don't know what area of your life is not okay. But this is what I know. This morning, God's trying to give you heaven's perspective. Because when you live life with heaven's perspective, pain always serves a purpose. You know, I've been pastoring for several years now. I've done a lot of funerals. I've yet to do one funeral of a person that's just passed away of old age peaceably. I get all the young tragedy funerals. And you know what? I love it. Why? Because my pain serves a purpose. I know what it's like. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah, oh yeah, I know. I believe this morning, God is going to turn something that's been so difficult. Maybe it's a marriage thing. Maybe it's a business thing. Maybe it's a you and God thing. I believe this morning, God wants to turn your pain into purpose every head bowed and every eyes closed I think there's two groups of people here I think the first group is saying pastor whenever you were talking about not being okay uh, that's me actually I've been just making it Uh, when you were talking about showing up at that restaurant and saying that you're all good I've been doing that I've been putting on a mask but this morning you were you're reading my mail like that's me if that's you and you want me to pray with you this morning, I believe God's gonna change you. The heart healer's in the room, and I believe he wants to do surgery this morning. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, if that's you and you're saying, Pastor, 
I'm not okay. Would you pray with me? On the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. It's just you and me looking. One, two, three. I see you, hands up all over, hands up all over. Hands up all over. Hands up all over. Yeah. You can put your hands down. Father, I thank you that you are a restorer. That means you just don't make broken things new again. You make them better than they were before. I thank you that right now you're restoring broken things. Dreams, you're bringing them back to life. Marriages that are given up on, you're restoring it. People that have not been able to sleep for weeks because they've been crippled by anxiety, peace is coming to your home. People here, you've been dealing with crippling depression, joy is coming this morning. Holy Spirit, come and move. Fresh wind, strength to get up and run the race again. Parents, don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't give up on your kids. Yeah, fresh strength, fresh hope, fresh joy, fresh peace. For the second group here, you're saying, Pastor, are you talking about Jesus, but I don't have a relationship with him? <laughs> when you were talking about that altar moment of surrendering your life to Jesus and that's when everything changed, yeah, I, I need that can't keep living life the way I've been living it. You can't do it. If that's you, I have some good news for you. You don't have to keep living that way. There's hope. It's a person and his name is Jesus. And he died on the cross and he doesn't want partial custody of you. Now he wants you. This morning, I'm gonna give you the greatest invitation you will ever receive and it's to have a personal passionate relationship with someone who is so passionate about you on the count of three if you want a personal relationship with jesus changes everything i want to ask you to raise your hand so i can pray with you one he's been waiting for you two don't miss the moment three if that's you you want a personal relationship with jesus i see you hands up all over yeah yeah i see you i see you I see you. Yeah, I see you. Put your hands down. Every head bowed. I'm gonna ask one more time. Somebody in here saying, Pastor, my heart's about to beat out of my chest. If you would just ask one more time, I'd raise my hand. Don't miss your moment. If that's you, you didn't raise your hand the first time. Right now, raise your hand. I wanna pray with you. I see you, bro. I see you. I got you. I see you, ma'am. Church family, can we pray this prayer together with those that just made that decision? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you were the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. I believe you faced hell for me, so I would not have to go. And you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is now my home. In Jesus' name, amen.